Hey class, I'm Mr Thornton and this is a combined Get That C and Top Grade Top Up video on the uses of polymers. This topic was suggested by Danny Alkafaji, Kieran, Becky Bentley, Rosina Akther, Dami Bakare, Liam Boy 29, Adam Patel, Haynes McNeil, RJ Boy, Rachel Elvin, M Morris HD and Abdul. Thanks guys. If you've got a topic you'd like me to cover, then just leave a comment below. As we discussed in the previous video, which you can see if you click just here, by altering the reaction conditions as we're forming our polymers, we can change what type of polymer we produce. Now, one of the most crucial things that we can do is change between the two main types of polymer. These two main types are thermosoftening polymers and thermosetting polymers. Now these two types, which all polymers fall into one or the other, these two types have two really crucial properties, which are quite different and that affects how they're used. Let's start out with the thermosoftening polymers. Polyethene, which we've already looked at, is a really good example of this. All that a thermosoftening polymer is, is one where when you heat it up, it becomes softer and it starts to melt. So as you heat a piece of polyethene up, it's going to start to become much more stretchy and much more flexible and eventually it's going to melt, it's going to become a liquid. The reason that it does this, and those of you who are doing higher tier, this is generally only on higher tier, the reason that it does this is because those uh, polymer chains within the polyethene, they're quite tangled and that's when it's a solid. But as it gets warmer, they get enough energy to start uncoiling and moving over one another. And as they move over one another, our polymer starts to become more flexible. So that's all that's happening really. Put more energy in and all of a sudden those chains can untangle and slide over one another. Now a thermosetting polymer is a little bit different. And a good example here is rubber. Now, normal rubber, before we've done anything to it, is pretty much the same sort of structure as polyethene. If we want to make the sort of rubber which we're used to day to day, which will hold its shape and resist the sorts of forces which would allow it to change shape like that, and if we want it to behave in a sort of elastic way, which we do of course with rubber, then we've got to do something different to it. What we do is a process called vulcanization. This is one of the first polymers which we ever figured out we could do this with. What we do is we add something to bridge the gaps between these chains and hold them to one another. In the case of vulcanizing rubber, what we do is we add sulfur and it's sulfur which joins the chains together. There are all sorts of different thermosetting polymers and they do basically the same thing. What this does is it means that the polymer doesn't change shape as it gets heated up its chains don't start to slip over one another. And so, for example, if you use rubber in tires and those tires warm up, those tires will still retain their shape rather than losing their shape and losing all the grip on them. Now, this is important in other cases as well. Probably one of the most common thermosetting polymers that you see is a type of polymer which is often used to make plug sockets and light switches and other pieces of electrical equipment which might potentially have high currents going through them. The reason that they're made out of these thermosetting polymers is because if there's some sort of fault and there is a very high current passing through them for whatever reason, it could well get very hot. And you don't want these pieces of electrical equipment to suddenly start to melt if they get hot. You don't want those bare wires to be exposed because the polymer surrounding them has melted. And so we'll usually make them out of a thermosetting polymer. And that makes them much safer. It makes them able to withstand high temperatures if there is some sort of a fault so that we don't end up getting injured or so that it doesn't start an electrical fire. By increasing the chain length, typically by letting the reaction run for longer so the chains can grow longer, then we tend to affect things like the density and how rigid that polymer is. So think about the different types of plastic which there are out there. Some of them are quite flexible and you can bend them with your hand quite easily. Others will be much more rigid and much more brittle and quite often that's just down to the chain length. We might add substances called plasticizers to make the polymers much more flexible, for example, if it's something that we want to wear, or we might change the conditions of the reaction to make it much more crystalline. 
to make these chains line up much better in a much more regular structure, which would tend to make things more rigid. And all of these changes can affect all sorts of different things about the polymers. Polymers are fantastically useful in the modern world, and they've got a huge range of applications. And it's not just the most obvious things that you can think of in your day-to-day -day life that are made out of polymers, but on all sorts of different scales we use polymers. So for example, we might use them for flooring, we might use them in various forms of construction, or we might use them, for example, to protect brickwork that's delicate. And so they can be sprayed onto walls, or they can be used as covering for buildings. We've got lots and lots of things that we can do with them besides just the obvious uses. And they're hugely useful because we can mould them to whatever shape we want, we can frequently make them different colours or transparent, and we can change those properties so that they behave in exactly the way that we want them to. And they're quite light and quite cheap, and they're also resistant to water, and they're resistant to biodegrading. Now that's brilliant while we're still using those polymers, but it does leave us with a bit of a problem once we're finished with whatever that product is. Because if polymers don't biodegrade, then we can't get rid of them in the usual way. If you've got food waste and you want to throw it away, it can quite easily be placed in landfill and it will steadily rot away. And after a while, there won't be anything left. Whereas polymers, they can, in theory at least, last for thousands of years. Of course, none of them have been around for thousands of years for us to be able to test that. But certainly we can see that they don't break down. And that gives us a real problem if they're not biodegradable. If we put polymer products into a landfill, then they're just going to sit there. They're not going to biodegrade. And eventually that landfill is going to get full. And then we've got to find somewhere new to put these polymers. It's not safe to burn them either, because as you burn polymers, they tend to give off all sorts of toxic fumes. It's not safe to do very much with them, because even if you've managed to grind them into tiny pieces and bury them somewhere or throw them away in the sea, then they can still end up in the food chain. Animals will start to eat them and then other animals will eat them and eventually they can start to find their way back into the food which is on our plates as well. So it's a real concern what we can actually do about these. One of the ways that we can deal with them, one of the ways that we can deal with, for example, plastic carrier bags is we can reduce the amount we use plastic carrier bags. In the UK, we've just introduced a five pence charge for plastic carrier bags, which hopefully will significantly reduce the amount of plastic waste which we produce. We're still going to be producing some though. There are other things that we can do. We can recycle plastics, so long as we know what type of plastic it is. Because there are so many different polymers out there, it can be tricky to know exactly which one you're dealing with. And it's not as simple as telling the difference between a steel or an aluminium can, which you can test with a magnet. It can be pretty difficult to tell what one polymer is from another polymer. So usually plastic products or polymer products which are going to be recycled are stamped with some information which tells you which type of polymer it is so that it can then be resorted later on and recycled more easily. Another option is to make sure that those polymers can biodegrade. Increasingly now, there's a drive to make polymers with biodegradable materials. That is natural plant materials like cornstarch in the polymer itself so that those materials can biodegrade and that polymer itself will then break down. Some carrier bags are already made from these substances. However, it's still relatively early days on that. Hopefully at some point though, we'll be producing a lot less plastic waste. I hope that video really helps you. If you want to check how well you understood, then try the snap quiz. The link is right here, and it'll also be in the description, along with all the other links for this video. If you want to check out my other videos, then click right here. If you want to download the free app I've made to help you with your revision, then you can click right here. If you want to subscribe to my channel, then you can click right here. Don't forget to leave likes, and if you go to the comments, you can give me feedback and let me know which topics you'd like me to cover next. Good luck in your GCSEs everyone, and thanks very much for watching.